Thank you, Rob. Let's pray. Help, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, my name is George Beasley, and once again, uh, I'm definitely honored to be here today. My, my beautiful wife of 33 years, Jacqueline Beasley, sends her, her greetings. We have two beautiful adult young women in our lives. One is 31 with a master's degree, MBA. And our youngest daughter, she is 28 and just under 200 hours from completing uh, the requirements to become a therapist, a licensed therapist. And so we have definitely been blessed um, as a married couple. I'm, 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 I'm a blessed man. Um, it is truly a great honor and privilege to be here today for we are here to speak into the perpetuity of your destiny. In the kingdom of God, there are set moments where we have these, what I call kairos moments, where you have an intersection with your destiny. The intersection that I had many years ago was with Rob Dirks, and Rob and I have been friends throughout all these years. And Rob says, hey, you know what? I know a guy you need to meet. His name is Scott. Scott uh, does such and such. And Scott and I got together. We had lunch. I told Scott the story. Scott said, I want you to speak. And I said, OK, well, here we are. The story is told about a young girl with her father on a cruise ship. And they were standing out on the deck early one morning in an eager anticipation to look for the sun rising over the vast amount of water. And the little girl, she would hear all of the camera lens and the smartphone buttons being pushed. And she said, and she'd hear, oh, ooh. And the little girl said, Daddy, Papa, Papa, I can't see. I can't see. So her father lifted her up on his shoulders high above everyone else. And she said, wow, I can see as far as my eyes will let me. Notice she didn't say, I can see a long way. She said, I can see as far as my eyes will let me. Well, I stood in my, my bedroom in my high school years looking at this shirt, a favorite shirt of mine that I like to wear, and the shoulder on one side was torn. I don't know how it got torn, but it was torn. And I had a decision to make. Can I, should I take this shirt and discard it, or should I mend it? Not having any sewing experience at all, but I, I, like, I like challenges. So I looked at the shirt, and I said, well, you know what? I got some extra fabric on the inside. What if I open up this side of the shirt and make this side look like the other side and just take the fabric on the inside that no one would ever know is taken out and make this little half moon type shape on this side and on this side? Well, what happened was I changed the entire appearance of the shirt and the wearability of the shirt. And I didn't know I was having this epiphany moment. I didn't know that it was God showing me early in my life to do like what that little girl had said. I could see as far as my eyes would allow me to see. And I stand here today as a result of that. Well, how did this whole thing happen? Well, George Washington Carver, the story is told that George Washington, every single day, relentlessly went into his his what he called laboratory, and George Washington Carver would say these words, Master, show me the mysteries of the universe. Every single day. And the master of the universe, the creator of Almighty God, would say, no, I cannot show you the universe. And every day, George Washington Carver went into his laboratory, and he said, Master, show me the key, the mysteries of the universe. And one day, God said, I won't show you the mystery of the universe. However, why don't you break down the peanut? Well, today you and I are re recipients in, you know, of many things that came out of the peanut. Correct? Correct. We know about the peanut. We know about George Washington Carver, correct? And so George Washington Carver said that when he was asked, well, how did you come up with understanding how to dissect the peanut? Because he was a chemist. He said, when I would go into my laboratory, and I would talk to God, he would open up the veil of the curtain. And it would allow me to see into a different dimension. 
when I would go into my laboratory, well, different times I go into social media, I will put down, I'm in my laboratory. And when I get into my laboratory, it allows me to see what my natural eyes cannot see. Dr. Miles Monroe said this, he said sight, he said sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. And it was my heart that I began to understand as a young kid when I was involved with so many things in life growing up in Miami, Florida, I needed to begin to discover what I want to do with my life. And so quickly I, I joined the military and I got in trouble in the military. I was court-martialed in Fort Leonard, Missouri. I was given eight months and God intervened because after you have a court, a court trial in the military, you are released. Well, God had greater plans for my life. I was released and I, for, for sake of time, I can't tell the whole thing, but I was released I was retrained to go back into military service, which does not happen. When you are sentenced, you are kicked out of the military. You are, you've been a disgrace. Well, God had a greater plan. I was then retrained. I was sent to Fort, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, which is the toughest military retraining brigade. And I passed with flying colors because it wasn't so much about a physical reconditioning. It was really a mental reconditioning. Well, then I went to Germany, bomb holder. And I got in trouble in, in Germany. I was given 10 years in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. And while I was serving time in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary, I prayed a, a simple prayer. I wasn't brought up as a Christian. My mom and dad, my parents were not believers. But I prayed. I said, God, if you're real, get me out of here. And I said four things. I said, if you're real, give me a wife that's younger than I. I don't know why I said that part, but I did. I said, for her to be in the military, I want to live in California and make me a preacher. Shortly after I prayed that prayer, my case was miraculously overturned. Yes, mm. my case was miraculously, over, miraculously overturned. I went back to Miami, Florida. I met this young lady who had just taken the ASVAB test. She joined the Air Force. She left Miami, Florida, ended up coming to Sacramento, California, and she said to me, she said, you know, I've been stationed in Sacramento, California. I said, what? I finally find the woman of my dreams and you're leaving me? Now, I'm not even thinking, I'm not even aware of what I have prayed because, see, I wasn't a believer. I was a non-believer, a sinner. And you know how many times what we would do with the Bible, we take the Bible off of its shelf and we use it as a Latin's lamp and we rub it and we make all these promises and when the blessings come out, we go, yes, and we turn our back and we go about our merry on way. And that's what I did. So now I'm here in Sacramento, California. I loaded up everything June the 8th of 1984. I arrived in Sacramento, California, June the 8th of 1984, June the 11th of 1984. My wife and I got married, so we just celebrated 33 years. Well, thank you. My wife said on our first um, holidays, my wife said, well, what do you want for Christmas? And I said, you know what? I believe I could sew if I had a sewing machine. So I got a sewing machine and a weight set for Christmas. <laughs> I, I had just gotten out of prison, so I was lifting weights every day. I was, I was big and I was, you know, hung like, like Rob and, you know, and, and so forth. <laughs> So I get a sewing machine, and that sewing machine began my journey in sewing. I began to make my our first daughter's clothing. I made my wife all of her maternity outfits. She was the best dress expecting woman on the planet. Yes, she was. How many of y'all remember wine stocks? Wine stocks back in the days. I literally would go to wine stocks after having went to the clothing store, which was the worst thing for me to do. I mean, yeah, I know it's kind of odd. A man that sews and goes into fabric stores. I would go into the fabric store and I would spend hours in the fabric store looking for fabric to bless my young wife with. And I would make all of her clothes and I would take the clothing to, to, to wine stocks and I would pick out all of her accessories and so forth. So anyway, now I'm making clothing. I get involved in ministry. I start being, uh, I, I began to become a youth pastor. And I served for several years, that's when I met Rob Dirks, I served for several years as a youth pastor. We went through transition in ministry to another ministry. How many of y'all know if you're in ministry, there'll be some transitions, transitions in ministry. And uh, we transitioned from one ministry to another ministry, and we got in that ministry. I was hired as a full-time youth pastor, went through transition in that ministry as well. 
And the Lord spoke to me and said to me, it's time for you to pastor. So we started pastoring a church. We pastored that church for 10 years. And after 10 years, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to shut it down. I, I, I was going through some things in my life. I didn't quite know what was happening. And I said, you know, Lord, you, you gave me this gift to sow. You gave me this talent to sow. I really enjoy sowing. Because when I, when I get into my laboratory, the Spirit of God opens up my understanding. And I begin to look at patterns. I begin to look at different concepts and strategies. And it wasn't until... August, it wasn't until October of 1984, after we stepped away from the church, I said, God, you know what? You gave me this, this ability to sow, and I want to start this, this tent-making ministry so I can be able to help my wife. You know, not that we're struggling, but my wife and I, we live by ourselves. Our girls are grown. They have their own home. They're doing well. But as a man, you know, you don't want to just be in the house all day long, they lying around. And, you know, I mean, there's a blessing to it because I cook. My wife come home to a nice home, a beautiful home, and it's well kept, and she has a beautiful meal. Don't be hating. This is what I do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's who God has made me. You see, because I made a decision. I made a decision that I was not going to be like my father. My father beat me, and he punched me, and he slapped me, and he called me stupid and dumb and ignorant when I was growing up. Because I didn't know until years later, and it's not a part of my story here, but I didn't know until years later until my father and I became good friends because I led my dad to the Lord. Amen. God used me because my father watched me for many years. When God impacted my life through the 700 Club, my, my story is told in the 700 Club, all, God heard, all my father heard for years was, Dad, God can change your life. Dad, and everybody in Miami, Florida knew that God in heaven was real because if George Beasley can be saved, there's hope for me. And my father heard me all the time talk about the love of God. My father heard me quote scriptures all the time. My father heard me pray for him like a madman all the time. And so he knew that my life was impacted by the power of Almighty God. And so to speed this thing up because time is quickly evading me, I, I said, well, you know, I, I want to be able to help my wife and encourage my wife. And so I said, God, you know, I need a sewing machine. If you will bless me with an industrial sewing machine, I'll start my own tent making business and I'll take everything you taught me in ministry, everything I learned in Bible college, all the different things I've learned. And I want to go to churches. I want to travel around the world. I want to share your story because it's not my story. It is your story. I want to share your story. And I want to teach people how to become entrepreneurs. I want to teach them how to do it in a biblical sense. So I need a sewing machine. Well, I was sharing the story with someone on the telephone. And they said, well, how much the machine costs? I told them. They said, go to Walmart. The money is on its way. I went to Walmart. I got the sewing machine. I started shouting and doing the Jericho march and the Hebrew dance and everything you could possibly think of. And I started crying because, see, God is faithful to his word. God watches over his word to perform it. The Bible is the launching pad of God's word, and, and we are to take God's word, and we are to put God's word inside of our spirit. And when we stand on God's word, and God says, okay, here's the opportunity for you to pray for someone. Here's an opportunity for you to engage someone. What we do then is we release by faith these, the word of God. When the word of God is released out of our mouth, out of our spirit, it becomes like heat-sinking missiles. It looks for the target. It doesn't destroy the target, but it destroys the works of the enemy because our prayers is to set people free. And God's word inside of me began to pray and wage war and tear down strongholds. And that's what God has called us here today to do in marketplace ministry because there are so many. Oh, I wish I had more time. There are so many people that are so bound, just like my shirt because of time here. Just like my shirt that had a rip on the, inside the, inside the, seat, uh, the, the, the sleeve here. How do you see, what do you see every morning when you wake up? When you go and prepare for your businesses, your transactions, your day-to-day -day dealings, what do you see? Do you see employees or do you see souls? that are ripped like my shirt? Do you see people? Or do you see contracts? Or do you see leads? 
instead of looking at souls. These people that God have put in our lives, they are souls. The Bible says that all souls belong to God. And just like I looked at my shirt, I had to make a decision. Should I dis discard this shirt or do I mend this shirt? So I began to look at the possibilities, as I've already said, what I could do. So I looked beyond like that little girl. I looked as far as my eyes will allow me. And God is saying today, look beyond what you see and who is working with you because they are a soul that is ripped and they need to be mended. So what did I do? How did I get to where I am right now? Well, I met this guy in England through telephone, through, through, through the um, Instagram. And I was looking at different fabrics on Instagram and I saw this advertisement for Huddersfield Textiles. I went to the company contact page and I typed the information in. I get a phone call from this guy who is the CEO of this corporation in Huddersfield, England. And he says, you know, I don't normally do this. I have a staff of people that go through the contact pages, but there's something about your name. I just feel I need to call you. Well, remember, England is, England is eight hour difference. And so it was about one o'clock in the morning his time. And, and I said, well, excuse me, sir. It's, one, one in the morning your time. He says, I oh, don't worry about it. He says, okay, what do you want? I said, well, you know what? I saw your company on Instagram. I, here's, here's what I do. I just want some samples of high quality fabric. I make clothing. I started a men's clothing company called G. Franklin Fashions Bespoke Clothing. I've been blessed to sew. I like sewing, but I want to start, you know, I want to do these things and so forth. He said, well, you got to buy some fabric. You got to buy this. I said, no, 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 no. I just give me some samples. Well, out of my frustration, I was getting ready to hang the phone up because he's a salesman, you know, he's the owner of this company. And I said, well, you know what, how can I pray for you? Those were the six words comprised of one question that opened the door. How can I pray for you? When I asked that question, he said the atmosphere changed and he said, well, and he told me. So I started praying and as I prayed, I heard this guy sobbing. He was sobbing on the other end of the phone. Well, by the time we hung, before we hung up, he said, George, he says, I, I got to say it like he said, George, <laughs> don't worry about the fabric. I said, okay, okay. He said, talk to you tomorrow. The next morning, my phone rings. It's this guy, he's calling me. Did you get the email, man? I said, what email? You didn't read the email? I said, no. So I pulled the email up and he sent the email to, he sent the email to his plant manager and said, Don, would you send George? That means my time is up. <laughs> he said, would you, huh? Yeah, 10 minutes. We'll just wrap up there at the end. Take it, take it. Thank you. He said, he, in his email, he said, Don, would you please send George our entire inventory? <laughs> and I read that again, like, oh, what? <laughs> and it said, and not only send George our entire inventory, but send George what our U.S. sales president has in Dallas, Texas. So now I'm on the phone with him, and I said, you know, I know what entire means. I know what inventory means. But what does that look like? He says, oh, brother. Well, do you see what's coming in the mail? DHL, the next day, I get this box in the mail, and it is loaded with, and, and, and is it Troy? Troy understands this lingo here because he understands the idioms of working in the garment industry. I get these bunches of catalogs of fabric of exquisite wools from England, exquisite tweeds from Scotland, and exquisite cotton from Egyptian cotton and linen from Italy. This is stuff I've been wanting for all of my years of sewing. You know, I'm going to the fabric store and buying this cheap polyester and cheap stuff, you know, that looks good, of course, you know, and, and feels good. But at some point, you have to begin to graduate to the next level because God take us from glory to glory to glory. We shouldn't stay on the same level our whole entire life. And here I'm looking at all this wonderful fabric. I'm saying, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And he says, George, do you know what you have there, lad? And I said, fabric? He says, no, you don't have this any kind of fabric. And so he said to me, over a course of a month, 
He called me almost every single day. What did this connection do? I'm going off my thoughts here. My thing is shut down because my time is up. What did this connection in marketplace ministry do between he and I? As a result, I ended up bringing him back to the Lord. I didn't know he was a backslidden Christian. At the age of 35, he made his first one million English pounds and he became very arrogant. And he turned his back on God and, and he began to do all kinds of different things. And his father said, son, listen, he says, God, the one who blessed you is the same one that can remove his hand and you can lose it all just like that. And he began to tell me over a course of, a, of one month about his life, not ever meeting this guy, just speaking with him. Every single phone call, God was pulling the layer of his life and he was telling me everything about his life. And he was sobbing and crying and telling me all of his indiscretion, every, everything that he had done, all the junk. And he said, I don't know why, I don't know why I'm telling you all this stuff. I said, so I let him cry and sob. I said, brother, let me tell you something. It has nothing to do with fabric at all. It's about your soul. I said, the Bible says all souls belong to the Lord. And I said, and you are a soul, and God is after your soul because he wants to impact your life. And then he told me, he said, what you don't know, George, is that I'm a backslidden Christian, brother. He said, my, my grandfather sits on the Council of Churches in England right now. I said, what? I'm like Arnold in the old, in the old television sitcom. What you say? You know. <laughs> He said, my grandfather, George, he sits on the council of churches in England, man. He said, you know, George, he said, I'm a backslider. I got arrogant. I became arrogant, George, you know. And, you know, and, and then God brings me this Christian brother. And he's crying. He's crying. He brings me this Christian brother, you know, and I don't know what's going on. I said, man, God stepped into your world. That's what's going on, man. I said, it's not about the fabric. It's about your soul. For the next six months, we are on the phone talking. For the next six months, I wrote, out a, I wrote out 12 discipleship prayers, and I sent them to him. And he's praying these and making these confessions, and he called me and says, George, I talked to my father. I said, God, I've been sleeping all night. I haven't been able to sleep all night for years. I've been sleeping all night. I've got so much peace. And I said, yes, you have peace because I've given you scriptures on peace. I've given you scriptures on different things for you to confess out of your mouth. And he began to do this. And then he called me one day and said, George, I sent you a very lengthy email. The email is our whole entire company profile. And the Lord told me he wants me to carry you by hand, walk you through the whole entire process, and mentor you in the entire industry of bespoke clothing. You're going to learn everything. And he says, and George, by the way, it's official. I'm making you my West Coast director of sales. And he sends me fabrics. I, I, I showed my, my, my pastor here, and Scott came to my home, and I pulled, out this, I pulled out the fabric and so forth. They have fabrics that are $600 a yard. He has sent me some of the most exquisite fabrics that range from super 100s to super 200 to super 220 which is a millionaire series of suits and so forth. And I'm not here to sell anything like that, but I'm sharing what has this done. It has opened up a door for he and I to have discipleship. Now he calls me and prays for me. Now he's calling me and encouraging me because we all need encouragement. We are leading people. We are, we are inspiring people. But at times, because we're constantly giving out and giving out, well, who puts into us? And someone needs to put into your life and pour into your life. And I want to say this to you today. Who is God bringing into your life that is like that shirt that was ripped? A soul. He's bringing a soul into your life. And he's giving you an opportunity when someone knocks on your door, leans into your world as a Christian. They're leaning into the purpose for you to take out the love of God, the grace of God, the power of God, and mend the torn places in their lives. I want to end with this. Two boys was walking down a dirt country road. And they saw this bird caught in the thicket. And they said, hey, let's grab this bird and let's go to the wise man's house. And let's ask the wise man, is this bird dead or alive? And they got down to the end of the uh, dirt road and saw Mr. Wise Man sitting on the sofa, uh, sitting on the outside of the, on the, on the porch in the chair. And they said, Mr. Wise Man, is this bird dead or alive? 
And the wise man, being wise as he is, he never looked in their hands, but he looked in their eyes and said, that bird can be whatever you allow that bird to be when it's in your hands. You see, God have entrusted unto you a business. You and I are not business men or women. We are business stewards. He has given unto us an ability to provide leadership for people that he bring into our life. People who are torn, people who are shattered. And all he wants us to do is be able to sit at his feet like Martha and Mary. They both were sitting at the feet of Jesus and no one told one sister to get up and go and serve. She got up on her own volition and thought she was doing the better thing. But he wants us to sit at his feet and stay there and have fellowship and coin near and do what George Washington Carver did. Master, show me the mysteries of the kingdom. But he didn't want you not to ask for the mysteries he is saying Lord show me who I can impact today in my marketplace ministry show me who I can touch show me who I can inspire show me who I can lift up show me who I can lead unto the golden road follow me and we're gonna go to see Mr. God not Mr. Oz but Mr. God follow the yellow brick road which is the word of God amen is that a hand question? Yeah. Amen, 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 amen. Well, thank you so much for coming today and allowing me to speak. I hope that you were encouraged, you were inspired, and I just want to leave this thought with you. God has given unto you the opportunity to partner with him for marketplace ministry. Don't look at people as clients. Don't look at them as a lead, but look at them as a soul. Because that soul is the most important thing. Not our contacts, not our contracts. Contracts come and go, constituents come and go, colleagues come and go, but souls are eternal things that God is wanting us to be after every, every single day. God bless you.